it's time for Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. What are you people? On dope? Or you can tow. I am here. Uh, or you can talk. I experimented with marijuana and didn't inhale. Or you can talk and talk. Ten federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. While we talk about tow on Toker Talk Radio. So, by the way, when it comes to pot, you know, if you're 40 years old, you live in a log cabin in Oregon, you got 12 giant pot plants in your backyard, have a ball. Live from beautiful Poplin, Oregon at Rolla J Studios. Plus your calls live at 971-533-7111. They're walking on their pants with their cap on backwards, listening to the end of a man, the Snoopy Snoopy Poop Dog. What's to keep somebody from getting all potted up on weed and then getting behind the wheel? Gateway theory doesn't work. It's a reality. Holland, is it real? Don't tease me. We're locking up people that take a couple of puffs of marijuana, and, and the, the next thing you know, they got 10 years. And now, here's your host, the guru of Gonza Graphics, the sultan of Sativa Statistics, and the worst nightmare of a reefer mad prohibitionist. A polite, perspicacious, productive pothead with a propensity for PowerPoint. Radical, Russ Belleville. Oh, welcome back, everybody. Monday, November 18th here at Toker Talk Radio. And I'm so pissed off, i got to get right into this story. I alluded to it when we were talking to Dr. Mitch. It's something I found over the weekend in the New York Times, and it just, whoa, it made me mad. The FDA, which has been denying medical marijuana for years, has approved a new drug that I'm calling Super Vicodin or Ultra Vicodin or Mega Vicodin. I don't know what to call it, but for years now, for years, we've been told that raw crude marijuana plants do not meet the FDA standards for a safe, effective medicine. Cannabis is still in Schedule 1, deemed to have no medicinal value, deemed to be dangerously addictive and holding a high potential for abuse. Now, that same FDA has approved a new painkiller called Zohydro. This is a pill that contains 10 times the opioid hydrocodone as found in the often abused Vicodin. And worse, this is the first approved opioid hydrocodone medication that has not been cut with acetaminophen or ibuprofen. And unlike the recently reformulated OxyContin in 2010, There are no additives to prevent its users from crushing and snorting or boiling up and shooting this drug. These concerns and others led the FDA's Anesthetic and Analgesic Drug Products Advisory Committee to vote 11 to 2 against recommending this drug's approval. But the FDA approved the drug anyway. (laughs) Yeah, well, no, it doesn't doesn't matter to you. So hydro, it's 10 times Vicodin. Yeah, let's, 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 let's let that go to market. They, they have approved this drug, even though the Centers for Disease Control have been telling us that fatal overdoses from opioid painkillers are reaching epidemic levels in the United States. A global study published in The Lancet found that opioid drugs are the most dangerous in terms of mortality, especially when compared to cocaine and marijuana. And Americans comprising less than 5% of the world's population, consume 80% of the world's opioids and 99% of all the hydrocodone. Now, also raising eyebrows is the fact that the company that the FDA has approved to make this new Super Vicodin, this company's called Alkermes. In addition to making this powerfully addictive opioid drug, Alkermes makes the popular naltrexone medication Vivitrol, which is used to treat addictions to opioids. <laughs> sure, this may be no more shady than cigarette companies that also smell so- smoking cessation patches until you find out that Alkermes also financially supports the American Society of Addiction Medicine, also known as Big rehab. When OxyContin first hit the market, there was this big spike in addiction problems, and experts believe the release of Zohydro will repeat that devastation. 
Yet, even as current opioids have led to an addiction epidemic, the DEA has approved a 1,500% increase in quotas on hydrocodone manufacturing throughout the medical marijuana era. Let me, let me restate that. A Schedule II drug like hydrocodone, Vicodin, you can't just make as much of it as you want to make. You have to tell the DEA, we're going to make this many tons of it, and they have to approve it before you're allowed to make it. 1,500% increase during the medical marijuana era. And when asked about this, a DEA rep explained that so many pain pills had to be made because there has to be enough left for the legitimate patients after all the recreational users had illegally gotten theirs. <laughs> wow, too bad that excuse doesn't work for medical marijuana gardens, huh? Cannabis has been shown to work synergistically with opioid painkillers to improve the quality of pain relief and reduce the amount of pills needed. Most clients of the Berkeley Patients Group that were surveyed said using cannabis allowed them to cut their use of prescription painkillers by up to half. But when there's so much money to be made getting people hooked on synthetic heroin and money to be made on the drug to help them kick synthetic heroin and money to be made on the rehab treatment for synthetic heroin, a safer, cheaper, effective, non-addictive herbal alternative that reduces your need for synthetic heroin is a danger to your bottom line, that is. All right, we got to take a break. And uh, when we come back, what have I got? Oh, we just got our first segment. We'll take your calls at 971-533-7111. We got Left Wing Larry in the studio, and we may talk about JFK. It's JFK week. And I'm actually sitting in a room with a guy who's met JFK twice. So maybe we'll talk about that. But stick around. We got to take a break. See you on the other side. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. I'm Radical Russ Belville, and I want to thank you for listening to 420 Radio. We couldn't survive without you and our sponsors, and I'd like you to check out one of our prime sponsors, the National Cannabis Coalition. I've been working with NCC since June of 2012, and I'm proud to be part of the team they have assembled. National Cannabis Coalition is building the partnerships with reformers, lawmakers, and industry we need to be successful. Visit the National Cannabis Coalition website at nationalcannabiscoalition.com or the easier to remember ncc420.com. That's where you'll get the exclusive first look at my radical rants, as well as informative articles from the nation's top cannabis pundits. Visit ncc420.com today, and if you have your phone handy, text Russ to 42420 to support NCC and 420 Radio. It's a free text message that helps us help you end adult marijuana prohibition. Learn more at ncc420.com, and thanks for supporting Independent Marijuana Legalization Public Radio. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect, and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating... I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707 829 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's Toker Talk Radio, 10 after the hour. Today is November 18th, 2013, and for the history buffs in the audience, you might recognize that as the 35th anniversary of the Jonestown mass suicide. 
It's interesting, they call it the Jonestown Massacre when you look online for it, you look in Wikipedia and stuff, they call it the Jonestown Massacre, which I don't know if that's the right term. Is it a massacre when someone convinces 909 people to kill themselves? I, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting case. For those of you that are too young to remember this, the Reverend Jim Jones was his name. Uh, he uh, was a, a leader of something called the People's Temple. They were a, a cult, and they were down there in Guyana. And he convinced 909 of them to drink this poisoned Kool-Aid uh, nearly 300 of them who died were children. Um, a lot of this had to do with the fact that a congressman, congressman had uh, f flown to Guyana to, you know, a fact finding mission, basically just seeking information. Congressman Leo J. Ryan. And this was after they had threatened mass suicide in 1977. When Congressman Ryan went down there, uh, the congressman and his crew and several People's Temple followers uh, were attacked by Jones's soldiers. Five people were killed, including Congressman Ryan, NBC correspondent Don Harris, NBC cameraman Bob Brown, and San Francisco Examiner photographer Greg Robinson. So once that happened, uh, you know, the world's attention was on them to, you know, take this guy down. So he went back to the compound and mixed up a powder mix with uh, cyanide and Valium. And uh, everyone drank it, except for Jones, who then... Uh, Killed himself with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Um, and there you go. So there's information about that. If you want to check online, uh, learn more about your history. Those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So learn about the Jonestown Massacre and whatever lessons need to be learned from it. All right. We got Left Wing Larry in the studio. How are you doing, Larry? Well, I'm doing pretty good. Right, it's better if I turn your mic on. Yeah. There he is. <laughs> Left Wing Larry in the house. And I, I could put you all the way in the left left channel too, but that would be oh, okay. that would be too much. Uh, so, oh, by the way, that that's where the term uh, uh, when somebody's trying to feed you some BS and uh -huh. they call it drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah, that's that's where, where that comes from. That's right. That's right. And Larry, if you sit up just two inches, it'll look like those little antenna from the 420 radio logo are coming out of your head. Oh, okay. I noticed that when Herb <laughs> was doing his show the other day. <laughs> it's like, Herb, there's antenna coming I out of your head. I got an antenna coming out of my head. <laughs> but uh, we were just hanging out here at Roller J Studios the other day. And, you know, of course, this Friday, the 22nd, will mark the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy in Dealey Plaza in uh, Dallas. Now, I've been to Dealey Plaza. Uh, I've, I've never been to Dealey Plaza, yeah. but I did see John Kennedy and Britt took part in a briefing of him four days before the assassination. Yeah, this was fascinating. I did not know this about Larry. Now, I know you'd been in the Air Force, but apparently Air Force intelligence, right? Right, exactly. So how did you get to meet John F. Kennedy? Well, the first time was uh, he came, came, came into McDill Air Force Base. Uh, I was stationed there with the 15th Tactical Fighter Wing. And I never talked about this for years. Uh, as a matter of fact, my parents even went to the grave not knowing this information because wow. uh, at that time, you didn't talk about it because it was all classified information. Sure. And you, the guys in the barracks, I lived in a barracks that had 60 people in it. Nobody in that barracks knew anything about my taking part in the briefing. Wow. Uh, the first briefing, the only thing I did was just point with a pointer on the wall. I <laughs> you mean, were a prop. I was a prop. <laughs> and uh, the captain gave the briefing. The second time... So how old were you at the first briefing? Uh, I had just turned 18 years <laughs> so of age. And, and, and Kennedy, so this is what, 61? Uh, 62. 62. October 62. October Cuban Missile Crisis. Exactly. So you're an you're 18-year-old... 18-year-old. Enlisted guy. Right. And there's the president in the middle of the biggest nuclear crisis the world had ever seen. Right. And you're pointing at stuff. I'm pointing at stuff. <laughs> For, oh, wow. the, for the president. You know. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, that, that was all I did in that part. The second one, though, uh, four days before he was killed. So 50 years ago job, tomorrow. My job was to train pilots. And uh, there was four different areas. It was evasion escape tactics, uh, enemy aircraft recognition, enemy ship recognition, and I can't remember what the fourth was. I'm as bad as that. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember what the fourth subject was. But I would rotate them. Uh, every Friday, I would give the briefing uh, uh, to the pilots and uh, tell them about any either ship recognition or evasion escape areas 
that they could go to if they were shot down in Cuba. And so we just found out like an hour before he got there that he was coming in. So I had to come up with something real quick. Well, actually, the major came up with the idea that I would take my previous Friday's briefing on evasion escape areas, and I would give that to the president, Okay. which was the same thing I had done the previous Friday for the pilots. Okay. Uh, so that's what I did. I briefed him on the evasion escape areas that were safe areas in, in inside Cuba. And, I, and Kennedy was a Navy guy, wasn't he? So it's not like uh, he yeah, was unfamiliar right, with right. this kind of terminology mm-hmm. or anything. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, uh, I just happened to be called upon to do this. I was the only enlisted man that, that did it. Wow. And I was, uh, I, at that time, I was an Airman Second. Uh, had a very colorful four years in the military. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had, I, me too. <laughs> Larry and I were talking yesterday about how uh, both of us uh, gradu- uh, turned 17, graduated high school, and three days later were in basic training. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, I was in, I graduated from high school on um, um, May 30th. And on June 4th, I was inducted yeah. uh, into the Air Force. And uh, it was like a whirlwind. Uh, went to tech school uh, out of basic training. I uh, spent 10, 10 or 11 weeks up there. And then I got assigned to McDill, which... Where is that, right, by the way? That is in Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. Okay. Uh, would, hence, I wound up back in Florida my later years. But um, uh, so anyways, that's my story. Wow. And, and I'm then, sticking to it. So, so <laughs> 50 years ago tomorrow, you're briefing President Kennedy, and then four days later, he shot in exactly. Dealey Square, Dealey Plaza, in Dallas. And I, you know, I talk to people. You know, I, I for my generation, it was watching 9/11 happen mm-hmm. and seeing those planes hit the towers, and we went, "Oh my God!" I mean, you, having lived through both, was it similar? The the the, the feeling? Uh, well. Everybody in Florida was scared shitless. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everybody in Florida was scared shitless. I walked into the middle of it. I mean, I, I had no idea beforehand what was happening, and I uh, arrived there on a Greyhound bus and uh, caught a ride to the base and got my assignment to a barracks, and within days, I was standing up there before the president pointing at things on the map. Camagüey, uh, I, 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 I knew that island by the time I left there, like the back of my hand. Hey, I, next I time we it. go to South Florida, we're taking Larry with us and we're getting ourselves some jet skis, man. <laughs> He'll know where to board us up. And fl- it, oh no, you want to land in this cove, man. Right, you know exactly. Yeah. Uh, there, there was, there, there was uh, missile sites surrounding basically Havana and then there were some down in the, the southern end that down near uh, uh, Guantanamo Bay, where Guantanamo Bay is, and then there was some uh, uh, actually west of Havana, and these were our targets: missile sites, surface-to-air missile sites, and uh, at that time we were flying. The pilots were flying the old F-84, which was a Korean War jet, and uh, it was suicide mission because there was no way those planes were getting down to Cuba and coming back. Hmm. No way. Was uh, it a fuel, not a fuel limitation, just the... Uh, it was fuel limitation, plus the plane was a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there was a reason it was called the hog. <laughs> I guess and so. It loved the ground. It did not like it in the air. <laughs> and not a good trait for an Air Force jet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we, we were in the process of transitioning from the F-84, the HOG, over to the F-4C, which was the latest, the latest in technology. And the pilots loved it. Mm-hmm. I mean, they absolutely loved it. And I sat there as they would take off daily, jealous as all hell, because <laughs> I wanted to be in the back seat of that sucker. No doubt. And uh, I would have been, had it not been for... Uh, the last class of OCS starting uh, October 31st of 62. Uh, I was actually had orders for OCS, and then they found out that I didn't have a, a year in service at that time. That was the, the rules. 
that you had to have a year in service before you went to OCS. Mm. So I lost my chance for OCS in the back seat of an F4. Oh, well, there you go, folks. But you did not lose the chance to toke on some state-approved Oregon medical marijuana. No, I did not lose on that chance. <laughs> so let's take care of that. It's 420 here in the Pacific Time Zone. I hope you are having a good 420 wherever you're at. We'll be right back. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. Cannabis Outreach Collective is an alternative health and wellness option located in Gladstone, Oregon that serves patients in the Portland area and beyond. We are a full-service alternative health and wellness collective accommodating patients with natural, organic, holistic, and homeopathic remedies, nutritional guidance, advice, education, and medical cannabis fully in accordance with Oregon OMMP law. You can find out more about Cannabis Outreach Collective on Facebook at COC503 or by emailing Cannabis Outreach Collective 503 at gmail.com or by telephone at 503 853 1319. Check out our menu on Weed Maps and visit Cannabis Outreach Collective today. Pipe Smoke Shop and Speakeasy is your source for cannabis community gear in southern Wisconsin. Owners Brian and Tammy Wood are located in Kendall, just outside of Madison, and they've got everything for the smoking enthusiast, including a full assortment of pipes, water pipes, hookahs, bubblers, one-hitters, and so much more. They're open noon to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday and can help you with your detoxification therapies as well. Call 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com for more information. That's 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com. And as always, Go Pack Go! 420radio.org presents Green Stream Radio with Grandma Cat on one and Tim Me from Olympia, Washington, every Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Pacific Time with replays Thursday at 11 a.m., Fridays at 4 a.m., and Saturdays at 8 a.m. right here on 420radio.org. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. 23 after the hour here at Toker Talk Radio. That's youth with number one stoner. We're hanging out here with Left Wing Larry and uh, just chilling and enjoying the day. Coming up next at uh, 5 o'clock Pacific time, we will have a new edition of Stony Sunday with Coral Reefer. So you want to check that one out coming up. In the five o'clock hour. And then at six and seven, replays of these two hours, the rest of the show and Toker Talk Radio. And at eight o'clock, a brand new edition live, the new Viper Hour. We'll be hanging out here, spinning some classic reefer jazz tracks and talking about the culture of the early 20th century reefer jazz era. So stick around right here on 420radio.org, available on TuneIn Radio and Spreaker.com. Follow us on Spreaker today. Ooh. By the way, we're up to 67. So I saw far. that. 60, we're two-thirds of the way there. Looking forward to it. We get, we get 100 people on Spreaker. I can submit it to iHeartRadio. And uh, we're on iHeartRadio, and that would be really, really good. That would be a good thing. Now, I wanted to get to an article I have written that just appeared on... Um, well, I got one that just appeared on Huffington Post, which is, What Does America Think About Pot? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the one. I already did that on the show, which is the uh, top... It's basically the top five public opinion things uh, that majorities now believe about marijuana. And so let me see. I'll find the link here if we can uh, get on the Huffington Post. And I'll post that in our chat room. Because the more comments I get on these kind of things, the uh, 
better they do. So here we go. What does America think about pot is right there if you're interested in it. And anyway, what does America think about pot? Well, that uh, it should be legal for adults 21 and older, uh, that it the federal government should leave states alone if they legalize, that marijuana smokers should not be fired for their off-work pot use if it's legal, that marijuana is safer than alcohol, and that marijuana is medicine and patients should not be punished for choosing it. So that is available now up on Huffington Post. But the other article I wanted to get to was the one I had written that appeared on High Times today, which is, uh, you know, I, I got to thinking, what's going to be the last state to legalize weed? Because when I go out and travel, you know, if I go to Texas, they say, oh, man. Texas, we're going to be the last to legalize weed. Yeah, and I felt that way about Florida. Yeah, Florida that way. Being a refugee from there. Sure. Everywhere I go, when someone's in a real bad pot state, they'll say, you know, that we'll be the last to legalize. And I started thinking, well, if I had to rank them, like, where would I put them? And I, I gave myself a little bit of a challenge by accepting the southern states. I didn't include the southern states in my calculations. For one, I think that's too easy and, and kind of like assumed. You know, Mississippi will be the last. No Alabama, no South Carolina, whatever. I'm beginning to feel like uh, uh, with the news that's coming out of Florida that uh, within the next couple of years, they're going to have medical down there. Yeah, that's uh, the thing. I think it's going to be a very, very, very restrictive type med medical. Mm -hmm. But they will get medical down there. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, and which... Uh, precedes Idaho, although Idaho is now talking about, or is it Utah? Utah. It's, Utah. With the Alepsia, yeah. The Alepsia. Uh, but uh, uh, you may be right about a state that votes uh, under no circumstances. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We will never, ever, ever, <laughs> ever legalize ever, weed. Ever. Ever. No matter what. Even if Jesus himself comes down and says, come on, read Genesis <laughs> and tells us to legalize weed, we will not do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's Idaho. But so I got to thinking about it, and I was like, I, I took the southern states out of the mix because my my <laughs> that's not the right phrase, Russ. Recalculate. Okay, my uh, long shot on how the South could legalize weed is the growing understanding of it being primarily a racial issue. You know, exactly. like that story I did. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're four times more likely to be arrested when you're black, and even if you're white and get arrested, you're twice as likely to not be charged or have the charges thrown out. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very racist system. And now the NAACP is jumping on this, mm -hmm. and so I think the South, you know, they got a, a there's, there's a strong organizational infrastructure in those civil rights groups, and you know, pushed the right way, I think they could legalize in the South quicker than some of these other states I'm going to name. Again, I think it's kind of a long shot, but. I still think it's kind of there. So here's here's what I picked as the last seven, starting with North Dakota. And the reason North Dakota is I can't think of, like, in all the time I've been doing stories, I can't recall a North Dakota story I've done. There's got to be some. I know there's a North Dakota normal, but I can, South Dakota tried a medical marijuana is bill a couple times. Is there anybody in North Dakota? <laughs> That's the thing. It's very <laughs> sparsely populated. It's very white. Uh, the largest city is Fargo, and it's got like 110,000 people. Right. And the mm -hmm. second largest city is half that, or about 60. Uh, 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 is it Minot? No, that's South Dakota. Well, I, don't, I don't know my North Dakota. But anyway, um, they do have initiative petitioning, so they could get it on the ballot that way. But uh, according to the, the national survey, North Dakota has the third lowest rate of monthly pot smokers. 4.3% of their population admits to smoking pot within 30 days. Still, it'd be kind of neat to legalize in North Dakota because you know what their license plates say at the bottom? The Peace Garden State. That would be cool. You're right. <laughs> legal, legal weed in the Peace Garden State. I'm Peace Garden State. Better than New Jersey in the No Garden State, right? right. <laughs> so... Lively Libra out there is probably saying, at least you get to gather signatures. Because <laughs> in Iowa, you don't get to gather signatures. So that was the next on my list. Uh, the demographics are similar to North, North Dakota. Very white, very rural. Uh, the cities are about twice as big, and there's about twice as many of them. So it's a little mm -hmm. better populated than North Dakota. But Iowa's second lowest in the rate of monthly pot smokers. Only 4.1% of its population are regular tokers. And since they don't have initiative, they got to go through the legislature and they got a legislature with guys like Clell Bodler. 
This guy, Clell Bottler, uh, I don't know if you followed the story on this guy. This is the guy that when they were discussing medical mar marijuana in Iowa, which would have been real restrictive, right? It had been that Midwest, East Coast exactly. style, mm -hmm. you know, we got to have six doctors' opinion and you're chained to a radiator and all that stuff. But uh, it would have been real restrictive. So to, to defeat this real restrictive medical marijuana bill in Iowa, Clell Bottler flew out to California. Right. Okay. What, yeah. he lied about his ass? He lied mm -hmm. about his hemorrhoids or something. Right. And uh, got, got a medical a marijuana medical recommendation mm -hmm. and then flew back to Iowa to say, see, it's all a sham. Right. So when you got that kind of guy in your legislature, it's a while before anyone's singing, I owe a lot to Iowa pot. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they're number six on my list of, you know, who's going to legalize last. Number five. Okay. If you can judge a state by, you know, how likely they're going to legalize by how strict their law is now, then it's got to be Arizona. Arizona, marijuana is a felony, period. Right. Possession's a felony. Planting a seed's a felony. A possession of a milligram is a felony. Pa passing a joint is a felony. Owning a bong is a felony. felony. Yeah. And it's the kind of place that would elect Sheriff Joe Arpaio. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know... <laughs> This guy, this nut that puts Old prisoners in 100, 110 degree heat and pink underwear. Yeah, that guy, right? But they do have initiatives and they did pass medical. It was like 50.13%, right. but yes. they did pass medical. So Boy, it, was, it was razor thin. So who knows? Maybe the skin of your teeth. <laughs> all right. So if I have to go further to figure out who would be the last state to legalize, Oklahoma. Uh. Oklahoma. Now, it's not as prohibitive as Arizona which is kind of like judging how hot the different rooms are in hell, right? It's like right. one's warmer than the other, right? It's still bad. Aren't they the one that has the uh, the death penalty for life? Hash? Life in prison. Life for in hash? prison, yeah. Uh, the Sooner State has, well, first of all, any marijuana first offense, any amount first mm -hmm. offense can get you a year in jail. A second offense, any amount, felony that can get you 10 to life. And any sales will get you life. And converting marijuana into hash or concentrates can get you life. And under their statute, keef is hash. So, like, if you have a, a box that's got the screen and it sorts the mm -hmm. keef, mm -hmm. life in prison for that. Potentially. So, if you've got a, a grinder that's got the Grinder, keef. yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Grinder, life in prison. Uh, potentially. But they do have more people smoking pot. 5.4% of their population smokes weed monthly. And they have initiatives. So... You know, maybe something's possible. Right. So for my ultimate here of the state that would be the last to legalize marijuana, I make it a three-way tie. I know I'm weaseling out. <laughs> but between these three. Idaho and who? <laughs> I can't. Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming. The three Intermountain West states. Idaho, okay. Utah, and Wyoming. First of all, I'm probably biased because I grew up in Idaho. But second of all, uh I think they'll hold on to prohibition even if the federal government legalizes. Even if the federal right. government ends their laws, they, they'll on be it. like uh, uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, they Mississippi, have dry counties. Exactly. And, well, and even worse. I think they'll keep the state dry. And part of this is because, well, first of all, Utah is home to the world's greatest concentration of Mormons. Mormonism is a religion that rejects caffeine. They reject this. You coffee. can't drink coffee or can't Coca Cola. Have a cup of coffee in the morning, right? So they reject weed pretty well as as well. Although I do know some some uh, alternative style Mormons who actually find support for the use of cannabis in the Book of Mormon, but that's a whole nother another topic. Uh, <laughs> uh, Utah also has the lowest rate of monthly cannabis smoking, three point seven percent of their population. Uh, now Wyoming is the most Republican state in the country. Sixty three percent of voters in Wyoming are registered Republicans, and the state house is seventy eight twelve. Is that where Cheney's from? No, he's from North Carolina. Che no, Cheney's from Wyoming. That's Wyoming. Cheney State. Okay, that's yeah, Cheney country. That's Cheney country. Okay. <laughs> and oh. that's another reason Cold why. Cold right? in here. <laughs> <laughs> we do not mention the evil lord, lest he, lest he be summoned by his name, <laughs> right? So, yeah, so uh, 7812 is Wyoming State House. Now, Utah's State House is 8519, and Idaho's State House is 8619 in favor of Republicans. So those three states... That's that's the most Republican part of the country. People think maybe it's the South or something. No, it, those three states are the most Republican. Hmm. And in Wyoming and Idaho, 
It is a crime to merely be under the influence of marijuana in public. Just being under the influence. Now, in uh, Idaho, I think you can get six months for that. In Wyoming, it's three months or vice versa. But one of them will give you three months. The other one will give you six months misdemeanor. And even though, as we mentioned, marijuana is illegal in Idaho, the Idaho Senate voted 29 to 5 for a resolution that states, Idaho shall never legalize marijuana for any purpose, including medical. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but, but, uh, it, it's already illegal. Yep, and it shall stay that way. <laughs> it shall be illegal forever. <laughs> so that's my bet. I think Idaho, Wyoming, Utah. And I know it's cheating because it's like uh, which state, and that's three states. It's really one state, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're all the same. <laughs> Idaho, Wyoming, Utah is kind of just one big, it, big it's state. It's just that Wyoming is a little colder, I think. Colder and more beautiful. Oh, my God, the Sawtooth Mountains in Wyoming. Oh, really? This is the thing about, you know, I, I denigrate Idaho a lot, you know, as far as the politics and stuff. But I understand why people live there. It, well, I can tell you there's some rough roads in there. I came oh. through it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. But Idaho and Wyoming have, and for that matter, Utah, you get in southern Utah and those red rock canyons and stuff. Mm -hmm. ah, some of the most gorgeous, gorgeous real estate in North America. That's uh, unfortunately inhabited by some of the most redneckiest people on the planet. Oh, my God. That's anyway. like uh, southwestern uh, uh, Colorado. Yeah. Uh, where, where they recalled the guy for... for we're voting for uh, uh, gun control. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break, and uh, I'm going to check up on the chat room to see what people uh, think about their state's chances. When we come back, we're going to talk about the NFL. There's some good games this weekend, and I want to talk about pot smoking players like Dwayne Bow. <laughs> we'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Let him bring in the beat. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel produces quality custom designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, The Russ Belville Show, Ganja John, and Cascadia Concentrates, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Adam's meticulous designs are individually crafted and screened in vibrant high-definition color. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. Дани Данько. Я редактор журнала High Times. Отвечаю за отдел культивации, или проще говоря, выращивания. Приглашаем вас в Амстердам с 24 по 28 ноября, чтобы посетить ежегодный турнир Cannabis Cup, уже 26 по счету. Там мы сравним множество видов марихуаны и кашиши из смежных кофешопов. Еще у нас там выставка товаров, Семинары по выращиванию, ночные концерты и вручение премии за лучшие в мире сорта марихуаны. Хотите получить 10% скидку со стамойста билета? Используйте промокод Данько на сайте cannabiscup.com. Ждем вас! I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a journalist. I'm a student. I'm a teacher. I'm a representative. I have cancer. The outdated laws of prohibition are more dangerous than the plant itself. 
I lost my scholarship. I was fired. 20 million arrests since 1965. This is getting ridiculous. Our prisons are overcrowded with nonviolent offenders. We had the opportunity to change. This is costing our country billions of dollars. Making my family and I fight in a courtroom is difficult enough when I'm already fighting through chemotherapy. There's no reason to be scared by tradition anymore. We can stop this. We can stop this. We are the American people. We can stop this. And you have our support. We are old. Young. Straight. Gay. We're every race and nationality. And we're not going to give up. You can tax it. You can regulate it. Apply age restrictions. You can create millions of new jobs. We can save our economy. President Obama. It's time for legalization. Legalization. Yes. We can. Oh, welcome back, everyone. 41 after the hour. We're here at Toker Talk Radio, the voice of the marijuana nation. And checking up on the uh, High Times article I wrote on the last state to legalize marijuana, lots of comments coming in on this one. Are people uh, chiming in as to which state they think will be the last? And <coughs> a couple of people pointed out there's no southern states on the list. And I, and I did kind of punt the southern states because, I, like I said, I think this is an issue that as it becomes more – people become more aware that it's a race issue. And when you talk about states like Mississippi that are 35% black and Alabama that are like 30, 25% black, something like that, you figure out that you know, you connect the dots on that and and that could be a, the South could fall a lot quicker than I think a lot of people give it credit for. Texas and Louisiana this year have had polls that have shown majority support for marijuana legalization. So. Yeah, and Florida also has the initiative process, right? Which uh, you don't have in a lot of states. That's right. Uh, yeah. Now, Alabama and Mississippi, Alabama and Georgia do not have initiative. I think does Mississippi? I think Mississippi is one of those outliers that does too. I have to pull, pull up the map. Has, has anybody legalized uh, uh, without the initiative process? No, legalized medical. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's been uh, the last eight states have all been uh, non-initiative. Non-initiative. There's been legislative, and before that, Hawaii. Uh, was one of them, and uh, Rhode Island was one. There's been a few. So it's I, about I think it's about half, half and half now. Yeah, about yeah, half and just half. Just about. Okay. And the easy demarcation is the ones that legalized by initiative get home grow, and the ones that legalized by legislature don't. Right. Pretty mm-hmm. much. Mm-hmm. So there's some wiggle in there. Uh, but anyway, I don't think the South, but still, yeah, Mississippi might be a hard sell. Alabama might be a hard sell. South Carolina might be tough, right? But still, the fact that I know marijuana activists in Alabama and Georgia and Florida and North Carolina and Arkansas and Missouri, mm-hmm. that they actually exist gives me some hope, right? And they are doing something about it. Right. They're I don't know. To anyway. I don't know any marijuana activists in North Dakota. I don't know any marijuana activists in Mississippi. Not saying they're not there. A few in Idaho, though. I know a few in Idaho. But well, that, that's where you're from, though. <laughs> there we go. So, I, you know, that's I guess that's my perspective. But there's some people that are chiming in here. Uh where uh, Sam Hopkins of Wisconsin, of Milwaukee, says it's going to be Wisconsin. Uh, Christina Blankenship uh, from uh, Tech Community College in Indiana says Indiana. I almost put Indiana on the list. Pretty much any state with an I in it is tough for weed. <laughs> but Indiana, that's the home. There was a representative there. What was his freaking name? Uh, the guy who is always the, oh, he's the Higher Education Act guy that that pulled the student loan money from kids when they get uh the Burton, Burton, not Burton. Oh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, awful, awful. Indiana's awful too. So good point. Um, let's see. So here's a vote for Florida. We got a uh, vote for Oklahoma. Let's see. Uh, Tennessee Bible Belt. Uh, it may be Tennessee, but you know Tennessee's got so much weed growing. I got a feeling that Tennessee and Kentucky are 
going to be a couple of the next ones by the way of hemp. They're, oh, they're going to come by the way of hemp. You know, like the other states have done with medical, it, it's going to be hemp up there. Yeah. We've got a vote here uh, from Lewis, Kansas, for the state of Kansas. It says he's a felon for possession with a prior over less than three grams. Yeah. So maybe Kansas, that's for sure. Um, ben Lawhorn, of, who's at the front desk of the Super 8, <laughs> says, uh, I will guarantee it's more than 4.1% of Iowans. <laughs> well, maybe Lively Libra can confirm. I don't know. You always have to, you always have to take the, the national survey numbers with a grain of salt because you are talking about an anonymous pollster representing the federal government calling citizens at random to ask them whether they have violated state and federal laws. Right. Yeah, that, that's that's the hell no. Well, of course not. Uh, right, that's the standard disclaimer for any marijuana statistic, pro or con. That's kind of like the next door neighbor thing. Right, it's it's a standard disclaimer, pro or con, on a marijuana stat that we can't really know because it's illegal. Right. I mean, other than some of the scientific stuff, we can know some of the scientific stuff. But you know what I'm saying? I'm saying like like well, uh, if use goes up, uh, then there'll be a problem. Well, we don't know because it's never been legal. The problems people have had with weed have primarily been that you get caught with it, you get arrested. That's been the problem. When that problem goes away, are there big other problems? I, we don't know. <laughs> you, you know, I, I find it kind of funny uh, that uh, they say that the, the group that's most against it, it is the 65 plus. Yeah. Most of 65 plus were hippies. Yeah. I mean, give me a break. I think you're all just lying. <laughs> no. I think if there is an increase, it will be amongst those 65 plus. Well, so far we've seen that. The the, the fastest growing demographic as far as pot use goes is people, well, 50 and older. Mm -hmm. But definitely the 65 and older are definitely growing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I found uh, some data today that uh, came from the Pew Center on uh society and so on with uh, great graphs that, and if you follow my pinterest account uh it's uh, pinterest.com slash radical russ all these charts and, and data when i find them for my rants and my studies i pin them up here and these are real handy for you can embed them and you can put them on blog posts and share them and you know when you want to know when something's up there it's it's up there right so here's some of this oh i thought there would be more of them where did they all go Let's see. But uh, we've got four in 10 people now think marijuana is a gateway drug compared to six in 10 who thought that in 1977. So that was nice to know, right? I can tell you, it, in 1969, I thought it was a gateway drug. I really did. Yeah. I found out that my ex-wife was uh, 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 smoking marijuana, and I panicked. I thought the next thing, she's going to have needles in her arm. Yeah. I mean, I actually panicked. And then, of course, two years later, I was smoking it. <laughs> All right, so here's the baby boomers, and this was the chart I wanted to get to. And uh, uh, for those of you that are watching on the YouTube show or the live play right now, I'll switch the, uh, I'll switch the video window over there, and we can give you a look at this because it's quite interesting. The percent of baby boomers... And the baby boomers are defined as 19, born 1946 through 1964. I'm a little older than, a little older baby than that. Boomers. But the baby boomers, and I'm a little younger than that. I'm outside. We're on either side of this demo. Right. Uh, but in 1978, when they were like 18 to 32 years old, 47% of them supported legalization. By the time 1990 hit and they were aged 26 to 44, you know, they hit their middle ages, mm -hmm. uh, it dropped At to kids. 17. Mm hmm. Now that they're aged 49 to 67, 50% of them support marijuana legalization. So the baby boomer attitudes have completely returned to where they were when they were young. Plus 3%. Plus 3. <laughs> and here's that generational one, the percent favoring legalization by generation. So your generation would be the silent generation, right? 1928 to 1945? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so you're in what they call the silent generation. You're uh, the oldest generation, the greatest generation which are the people born before 1928. People have fought mm -hmm. World War II, right? That was my father's generation. Yeah, yeah. your father's generation. In 1969, 7% of them support legalization, and the last poll they did on them in the mid-'90s was 14%. I can remember my father telling me that when, uh, when the horses out west would get into the 
he called it loco weed. Yeah. Uh, they'd shoot the horses because it <laughs> destroyed them. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> well, here's your generation. This is the, the silent generation has gone. Well, okay, so the, your greatest generation, as long as they could have been polled before they pretty much died, uh, their support doubled over a span of a generation. Your generation, 1969, the support was at 15%. Now it's at 32%. Doubled among your generation. The boomers, as we showed earlier, have returned to their previous levels. The Gen Xers, that's my generation. I get to be Gen X. Gen X. Yeah. <laughs> Gen X has gone from 21% to 54%. So again, more than doubled. And the millennials, those are the 1981 to now. That is your, uh, you know, uh, Brian the Red and your Bacon Nan. Well, they started at 34%, and now they're up to 65%, almost double. Mm -hmm. So across the board, any demographic you want to look at, the support for marijuana legalization has pretty much doubled. So I was in the silent generate. wonder if that's where the silent majority came from. <laughs> Maybe a Nixon silent majority. There we go. Here's their chart on the attitudes of who's used marijuana and why. Of the people who used marijuana in the past year, 30% used it medically. 47% just for fun. 23% used it both medically and recreationally. That's me. There you go. And 48% of all adults have tried marijuana. 12% have used it in the past year. That's about one in eight. Mm -hmm. I always just say, you see an adult out on the streets, one out of eight of them smokes pot, statistically speaking. Again, there's the chart on the gateway drug effects. Only four in 10 now think it's a gateway drug, and that used to be six in 10. So two people have changed their mind in uh, 30 years and three out of four people 77 percent say marijuana has some legitimate medical uses they provide the nice little map of the states there you go your medicinal versus your legal versus your illegal states and i think is this final one okay your final chart the majority of americans say enforcement isn't worth it our government efforts to enforce marijuana laws do they cost more than they are worth and 72 percent of the people agree just exactly it's a waste of time total waste of time, even, time and money even two out of three republicans billions think it's a waste of billions of, time. of dollars yes so there you go folks there's your information on that's from the pew center and uh i thought i had all those charts pinned up on my board but it looks like only one of them is there maybe it only lets me pin one per website that could be it uh the other graph that i i found the other day uh that was very useful was out at policy mike Let's see if I can pull this one up for you because it's a cute one too. Where are you at? There you are. Oh, we got to start him over. Oh, I can't start him over. I'll just have to get the video on here for you. Then we'll refresh it. That's what we'll do. But anyway, it's a uh, we are con we are considering uh, the difference between the U.S. drug addiction rate. And what we've been spending on the war on drugs. We'll end with this little graph here. As you can see, the U.S. drug addiction rate from 1970 to 2010 has hovered at below 1.5%, pretty much. The U.S. drug control spending has grown from 100,000 or 100 million or so to over 20 billion a year. We've spent more money. We've not gotten any better results. I read somewhere that, uh, uh, like, um, when the Marijuana Tax Stamp Act first came out, they, there was an estimated 100,000 users. Yes. And now it's what? 16.7 uh, month, million, million monthly. monthly. <laughs> well done, U.S. government. That's what your war on drugs have gotten you for. Sixteen trillion dollars or whatever. <laughs> we'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Cast your eyes up to the skies. What is it to live and die? 
marijuana legalization is always on 420radio.org. Be sure to join us for our late night 10 p.m. Pacific lineup, beginning on Monday nights at 10 with Drug Truth Network, Dean Becker out of Houston, Texas. Tuesdays at 10 p.m., Cannabis Cure TV with our friend Greg DeHote from Sussex, England. On Wednesdays at 10 p.m., Green Stream Podcast from Olympia, Washington. And Thursdays at 10 p.m., Hemp Beach TV from the secret location undisclosed. That's our regular weekday lineup at 10 p.m. late nights, Pacific time, here on 420radio.org. Make sure to check out our weekend lineups as well, featuring the music shows Big Daddy Fink's Funky Roller Rink, Herb Thrasher Flower Hour, Red Eyes Reggae Flashback, and the new Viper Hour in two-hour blocks, back-to-back, every weekend, here on 420radio.org. Ah, sounds like Portland. music from Orange Goblin entitled The Fog and I have no idea what relation Orange Goblin has to Green Goblin from the Spider-Man comics I don't know (laughs) I can't know everything people 56 after the hour just wrapping up here Toker Talk Radio hanging out with Left Wing Larry and uh, before we go I wanted to talk about the NFL Uh, I don't know if you saw the game last night Kansas City Chiefs previously undefeated getting their first loss up in Denver to the reviled Peyton Manning. I don't like Peyton Manning. I don't like any Manning. I don't even like Cooper Manning. I am anti-Manning. It's a long story. We'll talk about it later. But uh, anyway, uh, they lost 27-10. to 10. Chiefs couldn't get anything going on offense. And uh, Denver defense looking really, really good. But what was overshadowing the entire uh, weekend's story on this was the bust of Dwayne Bowe who's a wide receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs, who was uh, busted for a DUI and pot possession. Not a lot. Personal amount, right? Right. Everybody freaking out. Oh, my God. Busted for pot. I mean, really, I'm, I'm, I'm worried more about the DUI than I am the pot. Right? Exactly. But anyway, he's busted for pot, and that led everybody to talking about, you know, pot in the NFL and reading these stupid, uh, you know, comments in, in on blogs and stuff about, well, you know, uh, that explains why he's having such a bad season. He's not having a bad season. He's having a regular season compared to his averages. He's not having an outstanding season. He's not having a bad season. He's having a season, right? It's not even over yet. And then you think of all these other guys, real big stars, LeVon Brazil that was suspended, you know, Justin Blackman, all these guys that are great athletes that for no good reason are being sat out even as we've had polls now that came out you know, this last week that showed that majorities, even Republicans, believe that if marijuana use is legal in your state, you shouldn't be fired for using it off hours. So that would apply to the Broncos and the Seahawks. And then a plurality, more people agree than disagree, that even if it's illegal, you shouldn't lose your, jo- your uh, job for your marijuana use. So... I say, leave these guys alone, man. They're running into each other at full speed. Let's give them something that's good for concussions. What do you think? Exactly. Lead them away from taking all those painkillers on the sideline. Put a vaporizer on the sideline for them. When they get their bell rung, they go over and vape. Yeah, and maybe keep some of the younger guys out of the clubs. These alcohol clubs where they're always getting into trouble. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's far too sensible. That's about all the time we got here today on Toker Talk Radio. Thanks for being here once again. We're here every weekday, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Time. And you can catch our replays at 6 and 9 a.m. and p.m. That's right, 6 and 9 a.m. and p.m. How did I come up with those numbers, Larry? 6 that? and 9, how did I come up with that? I have it's just a mystery. It's just, just a, a mystery. It's a uh, coincidence. 6 and 9. It's an enigma. It's a riddle. Oh, I wonder what that means. <laughs> I don't what's know. Means? But anyway, like we got to go. What's that mean? I don't know what's, what's that mean. mean? <laughs> what's all mean, man? <laughs> Coral Reefer is up next on the uh, 5 o'clock Pacific time slot. For Left Wing Larry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. 
The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it.